pray. Heavenly Father, it is good for us to look to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you might be the just and the justifier of us who believe, who have cast all of our hope on your Son, whose death in our place purchases forgiveness, adoption, redemption, eternal life, a relationship to you. God, we have no other hope. We have no other love. Your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has loved us to the very uttermost, has purchased for us a love for you, which will never end, sustained by your grace into eternity. We thank you that we get to revel in these things, to rejoice as those freed by your love. And we pray now as we look into your word that you would be honored, that we would be encouraged, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 10, and we'll continue our study of the book of Romans. Very thankful as Denny prayed earlier for the ways God has sustained this body of believers in a, a unique season of suffering, of difficulty. Thankful for God's provision in having Josh Kelso take us through the book of James and what it means to glorify God in the midst of trials. For Scott Maxwell to be walking us through the book of Job to understand a, a perspective on suffering kind of behind the scenes of what God is doing for those whom he loves. And I think it's good for us this morning to reflect on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of what God has done for sinners at the cross. And for the hope that the gospel brings transcends all suffering. Indeed, if your sins are forgiven, you could say what we sang in that first song, take all the world, take it all away, I have Christ if you have Christ, you have everything. And this morning provides for us in God's word a, another opportunity to reflect on the amazing truth of the free grace of God in the gospel. I want you to read with me Romans 10, 1 through 4. Paul writes there, God speaking through the apostle Paul, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of law for righteousness to all who believe. What we see this morning is really a continuation of what we looked at last week. The chapter breaks in your Bible were added by men long after the scriptures were written. They were helpful to identify where to find things. It's sort of like an address. Where does my favorite portion of scripture live? Well, Romans 10, 1 to 4 is the address. But the chapter break of Romans 10 is something artificial. I believe a, a change in subject happens back in verse 30 of chapter 9. Now, really, that is the continuation of the end of chapter 9 into chapter 10. We see there a change from a focus on the sovereignty of God in salvation to human responsibility in salvation. We begin to see that God is focusing in Romans 9, 30, all the way through chapter 10 and then into chapter 11, the vehicles by which he brings about salvation, human prayer, evangelism, the responsibility of hearers of the good news to exercise faith. Of course, all of these things were down to the glory of God and culminate in the end of chapter 11 in that great doxology. And all of these things begin at the beginning of chapter 9 with the dilemma of God's integrity at stake in his promises to Israel. If God's promises to Israel fail, then how can you and I trust God's promises to us? And what we find in Romans 10, 1 to 4 is a continuation of all of these themes, God's integrity culminating in his glory, focusing in the gospel, 
That is the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ, but specifically the relationship of the gospel to the nation of Israel. The them and the they and the their in Romans 10, 1 to 4 that we just read is a reference to Israel picked up from what Paul said at the end of chapter 9. This morning, we're looking at four aspects of Israel's relationship to the gospel of God's grace. What is Israel's relationship to the gospel in Paul's day? And Paul here is making general statements. They're not true of every Jew in Paul's day, and they're not true of every Jew in history. But they are overwhelmingly true as general statements of the state of Israel in relationship to the gospel. And they were as true in Paul's day, even as they are today. The majority of Jewish people stand in the position of separation from the good news of the Messiah that was theirs. Meanwhile, Gentiles have come in great number into a worship of and belief in this Jewish Messiah. And while it's not true of all Jews in Paul's day, it's not true of all Jews in our day, it's also not true of Jews forever. There is coming a day, and Paul will detail this for us at the end of chapter 11, when the nation of Israel en masse will embrace Messiah Jesus. That day is coming. But what we see here in Romans 10, 1 to 4, is a reflection of the tension Paul felt as he wrote to the churches at Rome. The tension of Jew-Gentile relationships in an increasingly Gentile-populated church. Paul himself being a Jew and feeling a heartfelt compassion for his countrymen expresses this again at the beginning of chapter 10. We're going to look this morning at four aspects of Israel's relationship to the gospel of God's grace. And the first is this, Israel's relentless advocate. Israel's relentless advocate, and that advocate is the Apostle Paul. He was the apostle of the Gentiles appointed by Jesus Christ to take the gospel to people from tribes and tongues and nations and peoples outside of Israel. And yet he never lost his love for his countrymen. In fact, everywhere he went, it was gospel to the Jew first, then to the Greek. Every city he went in, he found a synagogue and preached Christ from the Old Testament scriptures in the synagogues. Paul was a relentless advocate of Israel and specifically of Israel's relationship to the gospel. Look at verse 1. Paul says, Brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. And you remember that Paul was not always Paul the apostle to the Gentiles. He was, of course, Saul of Tarsus, the Jew We read of his pedigree in Philippians 3. He was circumcised the eighth day. He was of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law found blameless. You could hardly find a better Jew than Paul. In Acts 22.3, he says, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are all today. Paul was a Jew. And he begins Romans 10.1 with this statement, brethren, brethren. Who is he talking to when Paul says brethren? He's not talking about his brothers, the Jews. He's talking to the church. This is his affectionate term for Christians, Jew and Gentile together in one body, brothers and sisters in Christ, people of all ages, people from all places, all walks of life and all stations of life who have embraced Jesus Christ. He calls them brothers. You see, for Paul, the Jew, the church was his family. The church was his identity. The church was his affinity. And so he expresses to his brethren his heartfelt fondness for his countrymen. He says, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them. Them is Israel. And and this phrase, my heart's desire, is the the same phrase that God used of his beloved son at the Mount of Transfiguration and at his baptism. This is my beloved son. It, It is my heart's good pleasure, Paul says, towards them. 
Paul has a deep-seated, heartfelt desire And he intercedes on their behalf. Notice he says, my prayer to God for them. This is urgent request to meet a pressing need. This is Paul's relentless petition. He is petitioning God for something specific on behalf of Jews. And consider the people that Paul is praying for. At this point in Paul's life, the Jews, his own countrymen, have been nothing but enemies towards him. He says the Judaizers were the greatest opposition to his mission with the gospel. And they hounded him his entire life. In Philippians 3, he calls them the dogs, the evil workers, and the false circumcision. He says, beware of them. In 2 Corinthians 11, he recounts the 39 lashes received from the Jews. He was beaten with rods. He was stoned and left for dead. In Romans 9, 1, Paul says, I'm telling the truth in Christ, I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart for them. And in Romans eleven twenty eight, 28, he calls them enemies for the sake of Christians and yet beloved for the sake of the fathers. That is that twin status of unrepentant Israel in Paul's day. Enemies of the gospel and yet beloved. This is a a tension in Paul's heart and it expresses a compassion for enemies and a longing for those enemies to know and love Christ. He has anguish over their spiritual state. What is Paul's heart-wrenching desire? What is his relentless petition before the Lord? It is for their salvation, verse 1. Paul longs for their sins to be forgiven. Consider that. Think of the long list of sins that the Jewish leadership committed against Paul personally. And what is Paul's longing? I want those sins to be forgiven. To be wiped clean and to never be remembered again. I want them to know Christ. There's a sideline sermon in here in verse 1. Paul has just got done wrapping up a whole chapter on election and predestination and the sovereignty of God and the saving of undeserving sinners. And yet Paul prays. I don't know if you've ever thought, well, what good is prayer if God is sovereign? I've thought that. I've made that argument. Maybe you've heard people make that argument. But Paul here is reflecting the truth that when we pray for someone's salvation, what are we asking for? We're asking God to do what only God can do. Why pray if God is sovereign? Um, How could you pray if God isn't? (laughs) We pray because God actually can save sinners. And so we relentlessly petition on behalf of the enemies of the gospel that they would embrace Christ. Paul does that here. Similarly, people have asked, why do evangelism if God is sovereign? Well, Paul detailed God's sovereignty in Romans 9, and he's going to detail evangelism in Romans 10. These things are not enemies. In fact, evangelism is successful precisely because God is sovereign and saves sinners, and he uses means. He uses the means of beautiful feet who take the gospel to those who need to hear. So we ought to pray like Paul, evangelize like Paul, who was confident in God's sovereignty and salvation. It's not dissimilar, or it is similar to the way Daniel prayed on the basis of Jeremiah 29, 10, and 11. You remember Jeremiah 29 makes the promise that when 70 years have been completed for Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you to bring you back to this place, back to Jerusalem. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper. That was a specific promise to Israel through Jeremiah to end the Babylonian in captivity after 70 years. Daniel, aware of this prophecy, in fact, counting on this prophecy, prays in Daniel 9, and I won't read that whole prayer to you, but you can write down Daniel 9, 16 to 19, where he appeals to that very promise and asks God to forgive the sins of his people and draw them back to Jerusalem. What is Daniel praying? Daniel's praying that God would keep his word and do the very thing that he had promised, and do the very thing that he was sovereignly able to accomplish. 
There's another sort of sideline sermon here embedded in verse 1. I believe there's an example here to follow in the Apostle Paul and, and specifically in his love for his enemies. Let me ask you this. How well do you love those who set themselves against you? Do you hold grudges or harbor bitterness? How do you respond when wronged? Are you mindful of people's eternal destinies? Specifically of those who cross you. Do you love only people that love you in return? Are you easily offended? When someone sins against you, are you more grieved for yourself than for the other person and what they will face under God's eternal judgment? Do you write people off? Do you give up on people quickly? Why not rather be wronged for the sake of the gospel and for the sake of compassion to allow my own suffering to be a witness to the life-transforming power of the gospel. These are tall tasks, impossible tasks, naturally speaking. And yet these things, these very things are displayed in the Apostle Paul, and they're embedded in this heartfelt desire and petition in verse 1, in God's relentless advocate on behalf of Israel, the Apostle Paul. There's a second aspect in this passage about Israel's relationship to the gospel, and it is Israel's lost condition. Verse 2, Paul says, For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Paul begins with the, verse, with the word for in verse 2. It is an explanation of verse 1, and what he's explaining is <laughs> why he prays for their salvation. I'm praying for their salvation, verse 1, because verse 2, they're not saved. They're not saved. Paul here is telling us about Israel's lost condition. And, and he says this is serious business. He begins, I testify. That is a, a solemn public declaration of serious matters. And what is Paul testifying here? That they have zeal for God. They have zeal for God. It sounds great. Shouldn't people who love God have zeal for him? Yes, zeal is a good thing. Zeal is neutral. It all depends on what you're zealous about. And in this case, the Jews were zealous for good things, for the right God. They had the right book. You know, there are lots of books out there, lots of so-called gods out there to be zealous for. Lots of ways to heaven, lots of ways to live, so-called. And the Jews were tenaciously loyal to the Old Testament scriptures, to the God of the Bible. They had worked out a meticulous obedience, and no doubt an obedience of their own reckoning and their own approval, but you could not fault them for zeal. Paul talks about his own unregenerate state as a Jew as being very zealous. Listen, Paul knew this Jewish zeal intimately from two sides. Saul, the zealous persecutor of the blasphemous defectors from Judaism, the Christians. He persecuted them. And Paul, the persecuted apostle of the gospel of Jesus the Messiah. Paul knew this zeal from both ends. He persecuted and was persecuted by that same zeal. Jesus told his followers in John 16 too, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue and an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think he is offering service to God. That's a serious zeal for God, for the right God. But notice what Paul says about their zeal. It is a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. Not in accordance with knowledge. And how good was such zeal? What, what did that zeal accomplish? Well, that zeal accomplished the crucifixion of an innocent man. The crucifixion of a man they assessed as a blasphemer. The man Christ Jesus, the Messiah. The one who is actually God in the flesh. What did that zeal for God accomplish? Deicide. The murder of God. They refused his message. They persecuted his followers. 
The Apostle John writes this, light shines in the darkness, speaking about Jesus, God in the flesh, and darkness did not comprehend it. It was a zeal without knowledge. The darkness didn't comprehend it. John 1.10, he was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. In Acts 13, 27, Paul's in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch, speaking to his own countrymen, and he said, For those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither Jesus nor the utterances of the prophets which are read every Sabbath, fulfilled by those, fulfilled these by condemning him. What a tragic irony. Zealous for God, reading the scriptures, reading the scriptures that say that Messiah would be killed, and then fulfilling those scriptures themselves in their zeal. Paul knew this seal. Paul knew their obediences, their meticulous keeping of rules in an external fashion. Robert Haldane says about this, there is a perverse and obstinate ignorance at the very heart of their knowledge and in the center of their dedicated and meticulous obedience and obstinate disobedience. That's right. In fact, if we were to summarize Jesus' assessments of the Jewish leadership in Matthew 23, we would characterize them as self-exalting, damned, damning others, hypocrites, ambitious, greedy, pretentious, outwardly religious, showy, neglecting justice, faithless, blind, thieves, self-indulgent, whitewashed tombs, filthy, outwardly righteous, full of lawlessness, murderers, snakes, hell-deserving, and hell-bound. That's how Jesus described the state of the religious leaders. And Paul was them. Listen to Acts 22, 3 to 5. Paul reporting on his former life. I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, zealous for God just as you are all today. I persecuted this way. That is the the church, those who believe the gospel. I persecuted them to the death, binding and putting both men and women into prisons, as also the high priest and all the council of the elders can testify. From them, I also received letters to the brethren and started off for Damascus in order to bring even those who were there to Jerusalem as prisoners to be punished. Paul knew what it was to have this zeal without knowledge. He says in Galatians 1.14, I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. And then, after Paul met Jesus on that road to Damascus, and God opened his eyes, and God rescued Paul, Rescued Paul only to put him in a position of being on the run from the very group of zealous men that he was a part of. And so he came to know Jewish zeal without knowledge from both sides. Now let's consider for a moment this phenomenon of zeal without knowledge. You know, it's unkind in our day to question someone's spiritual state. Whatever somebody says, well, we just have to take that at face value. It just is what it is. I mean, how how could I question someone else's experience or someone else's profession? And the big words of today are sincerity and authenticity. I mean, you're nothing if you're not authentic. Uh, We have the phrases, you be you and you do you and Go big or go home. I mean, just whatever you're going to do, you do what you do. You be who you are and just do it big. Because, I mean, you got to be authentic. Authenticity is, is in contrast to repentance, by the way. You actually can't get to heaven, you being you and you doing you and going big and going home. That doesn't work. That is the highway to hell. That is the broad path to destruction. You actually need to be rescued from you. You actually need to be different. And this whole idea that repentance therapy is somehow fraudulent and and takes people away from authenticity is a lie from hell, a lie bent on keeping people hell-bound. 
You need to be different than how you were born. The whole call for sincere, authentic self-actualization, self-aggrandizement is self-worship that will kill you. Sincerity by itself accomplishes nothing. You can sincerely believe that you shouldn't pay federal taxes and the IRS will get you. You can sincerely believe that you can jump off a tall building and gravity will get you. There are cold, hard facts that rub up against all of our authenticity. During World War II, a B-24 bomber called Lady Be Good was flying bombing missions over Germany from Italy. And returning from a bombing mission, it got separated from the rest of the formation of bombers. And with a 200-knot tailwind, and clouds hanging over the Italian countryside, the Lady Be Good flew past its field where it was supposed to land. And because the tailwinds were so high, it was going 200 miles an hour faster than it thought it should, and they did not believe their instruments when their instruments told them, you're over the field, circle down, go through the clouds, and land. They thought, oh, it's not time to be home yet. And so they kept flying. The instruments must be broken. Well, the Lady Be Good wasn't found until the 1970s in the Sahara Desert. And all the men of the crew of the Lady Be Good survived the crash, and their skeletons were found, and their journals with them as they tried to march across endless, vast desert. And they starved. Now, they sincerely wanted to get home. But flying in the wrong direction, all of their sincerity amounted to nothing. Listen, you can be authentic, but it's much better to be right about eternity. It's better to have Christ than to be sincerely on the highway to eternal destruction. What does Paul say about the Jews in his day? They have zeal for God, but a zeal without knowledge. Therefore, I pray earnestly for their salvation. They need to be rescued from that sincerity, rescued from that zeal, rescued from all that authenticity. And that leads us to a third aspect of Israel's relationship to the gospel, and it is Israel's rejection of grace. Israel's rejection of grace in verse 3. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The main idea of this verse is the last part. They did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The first two phrases are the causal ideas underneath that. Why did they not subject themselves to the righteousness of God? Well, because they didn't know God's righteousness. They chose to be ignorant about it. And instead of God's righteousness, they tried to replace his with theirs. Tried to put their own in place. First of all, they ignored the reality of God's righteousness. And this ignorance here is not a sweet, little, innocent, well, I just didn't know. It is willful, culpable ignorance. They ignored the reality of God's righteousness. They attempt to establish their own righteousness, and so they rebel against the grace of gift righteousness. First of all, they ignore the reality of God's righteousness. Again, a a willful ignorance, this not knowing in verse 3, is a moral fault. It is a morally culpable ignorance. Uh, Similar in Matthew 13, follows right on the heels of Matthew 12. And Matthew 13 is where Jesus begins in his public ministry to speak to the people in parables. Why did he speak to the people in parables? It was a judgment so that hearing they would not understand. And why did Jesus judge the people so that he spoke to them in ways that were confusing to the public? Because they rejected his message when he clearly taught them. In fact, in Matthew 12, the Jewish leadership ascribed Jesus' power to Satan rather than to the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said, okay, that's it. No more clear teaching. God's judgment is you get to hear what I'm saying, but you're not going to understand. What a tragedy to willfully ignore God's truth 
this not knowing is morally culpable. It's similar to John chapter 12, following right on the heels of John chapter 11. In John 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. In John 12, the religious leaders tried to put Lazarus to death. They couldn't deny the resurrection. But they had to bury the evidence. This is a deliberate closing of the mind toward the truth of God. And this kind of not knowing is criminal ignorance, and it leads to eternal destruction. And notice specifically what they don't know. Verse 3, not knowing about God's righteousness. What is this God's righteousness here? This is a righteousness that belongs to God. And we'll see in a moment, this is a righteousness that comes from God. But first and foremost, it is a righteousness that belongs to him. It, it is according to his standard. And God's standard of righteousness is absolute perfection. The requirement to meet that standard is flawless conformity to that standard. To talk about God's righteousness but not meet the standard is to miss God's righteousness. And the Jews underestimated God's standard and they underestimated their own sin. They overestimated their own ability to meet the standard with their sinful resources. The righteousness of God is a righteousness that no sinner could ever produce. And the righteousness of God that Paul is talking about here is the righteousness that God gives by his grace to sinners that turn to him. This is the theme of Romans. This is the very righteousness of God that Paul has been developing throughout the book. Remember Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, the good news. Why? Because in it, the righteousness of God, verse 17 of chapter 1, is made known, manifested. It is given freely. Listen, the gospel is not shameworthy because in the gospel, God freely gives his righteousness to undeserving sinners. This is how God can be both just and the justifier, the one who declares righteous, of those who believe. Romans 4, 5, God is willing to declare righteous the ungodly. This is the, the great gift of the perfect standard of righteousness credited to the sinner's account the account of the unrighteous. And he gets to be called righteous, treated as righteous, rewarded as righteous, all by grace. This is grace righteousness. And it comes through faith. Later on in chapter 10, Paul is going to describe this as faith righteousness over and against law righteousness. Only faith righteousness saves. And it comes as a gift by God's grace this is a righteousness that is outside of me. Many have called it an alien righteousness, a righteousness that comes from God. Paul described it that way in Philippians 3. Paul says, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ and I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from law, but a righteousness that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And Paul says of the Jews in his day, they did not know about this righteousness. And worse, they ignored it. They ignored it. And it's not as if this faith righteousness was something new since the cross. The cross was the purchase price that purchased redemption for all who have faith. But faith righteousness goes all the way back to the beginning. Think Genesis 12, the first few pages of your Bible. God is describing this very thing through Abraham. Abraham believed God and it was what? Credited to him as righteousness. This is gift righteousness, grace righteousness, faith righteousness to the head of the Jewish nation. And really, Israel begins with his grandson. But they look to Abraham as Father Abraham. And faith righteousness goes all the way back there. And instead of embracing this gift righteousness through faith, they attempted to establish their own righteousness. Romans 10.3. What a, what a tragic attempt to, to spurn God's grace 
and to offer up your own trash in its place. The failure to understand God's righteousness and, and to offer in the place of God's righteousness their own righteousness. And, and you remember James 2.10? If you stumble across the law at any one point, you've broken the whole thing. And the law itself said, if you're going to live by law, you have to live by all of it. And how are you going to fix it once you broke it? You, you, you can't, as a lawbreaker, fix the law you broke. <laughs> You're already a lawbreaker. It's too late. You know Isaiah 64, 6, where God condemns Israel. All your righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Uh, another pastor, Tom Pennington, was, uh, I listened to his uh, comments on this verse this week. And he said, you know, don't think about all my sins are filthy, Isaiah 64, 6. But take your top 10 deeds. Take the 10 best things you can think of that you would ever have done. And what's God's assessment? Filthy rags. To assess my own good deeds that could come out of me as somehow acceptable before a holy God is, is the worst idea. They thought they could be good without grace when God demands righteousness Man can only produce wickedness. And then man assumes that his wickedness is righteousness and he won't surrender it. He won't let it go. The pride gets in the way and he clings to his own righteousness as his only hope. And then he has the audacity to assume he will present it before God as something that will assuage wrath. When all along it has only provoked God's wrath. But the technical term for this righteousness is found in Philippians 3.8. Paul calls it a pile of excrement. That's what it is. All of Paul's best deeds as a, as a Jew zealous for God were a pile of excrement that needed to be gotten rid of, not offered to God. To supplant God's gift righteousness to, to trade that in for your own garbage and offer it to God. It, it's to, to call your anchor your life raft and to cling to it all the way to the bottom of the ocean. And not understanding God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, verse three, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. They did not put themselves under it. They did not surrender to it. They did not come up under this free gift of righteousness. They, in fact, rebel against the grace of gift righteousness. And this is the main idea of verse 3. They rebel against grace. To ignore God's righteousness, to try to establish their own, both of these audacious crimes, and the result is a rebellion against a free gift of love from God to the sinner that's undeserved. They failed to submit to a free gift of alien righteousness, which they could never earn, which would immediately cure every evil and solve every problem. And look, this reveals the wrong thinking behind the idea that I might... I might try my best, and, and, and whatever's left over, Jesus can take care of at the cross. That is essentially the doctrine of Roman Catholicism. That is essentially the doctrine of the Christian cults, that I got to do, try hard, and then God will be kind with the little bit he has to make up. And nothing could be further from the truth. You, you don't get to just add a little bit of Jesus to your otherwise wonderful life that has a few deficiencies. No, you must abandon all of you to the grace of God offered freely in Jesus Christ. And that leads to the last relationship in this section of Israel to the gospel. It is Israel's only hope. Verse 4, and Israel's only hope is Messiah Christ Jesus. For Christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes, Paul says. Christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, you have to know this verse has generated a lot of controversy. There's been a lot of ink spilled on what Paul means uh, 
And I think a lot of the ink has been spilled unnecessarily by limiting our idea or our understanding to the simple phrase, Christ is the end of the law. And people want to put a period there and then answer the question, in what sense is Christ the end of the law? And then you have to define law. Does he mean Mosaic law, the Ten Commandments, all of the Old Testament, law in general? And there's lots of arguments about all of those things. And then what does the word end mean? Does it mean end as in goal? The Greek word telos can mean goal. The goal of the law is Christ. The goal of trying to keep law is Christ, like a tutor leads us to Christ in Galatians. Or, or the, the fulfillment of the law is Christ, meaning either that Christ fulfilled all the commands of Old Testament law or all the demands of Old Testament law are actually fulfilled in Christ. Others take end of the law as termination and they say, look, if you come to Christ, no more rules. Whole systems of theology built on that premise. Or when Christ came... Mosaic law went away. Now, it is true that Mosaic law ran its course and that when Christ came, Mosaic law no longer stands. It is also true that Jesus kept the Old Testament law's requirements. He was born under Mosaic law. He had to keep the rules so that he would not be a lawless one, so that he would be qualified to stand as Messiah in our place, as a perfect spotless lamb and sacrifice. And it is true that Jesus is the goal to which the law was to lead us, even as a a tutor leads to Christ. And he is the one to whom the whole Old Testament points. But none of those things are Paul's point here. That is not the argument Paul is making. And if we don't put a period after Christ is the end of law, then I think we can understand Paul's meaning. He's not giving here a theology of the law. He's not attempting to answer the question, must a New Testament Christian keep Old Testament regulations? We misunderstand the verse if we stop at Christ as the end of law. But I think the New American Standard Version captures Paul's meaning well. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. And really, we should see the idea of law for righteousness as one idea. The the prepositional phrase for righteousness modifies law. It, It is a kind of law, a kind of approach to law, which is an attempt to attain righteousness by law. And Christ ends that, terminates it, brings it to an end. Literally, the text reads, Christ is the end of law for righteousness for all who believe. Paul doesn't actually say the law. I don't believe he designates even Mosaic law, even though the Old Testament law would have been the best example of law and God's very given law. But what's critical here is the phrase for righteousness. This is law unto righteousness. And then the phrase for all who believe. In other words, this isn't just about Jews and Mosaic law. There's a much bigger principle at stake here that transcends every kind of law, every kind of religion, every kind of approach to God in every era for every human being. Nobody will ever get to God by keeping rules. You will never merit God's favor. You will never make up for your crimes by trying to be better, do gooder, try harder. It won't work. It can't work. And as we looked at last week, all your running that race only makes the race longer and makes you more culpable before God. Paul's point here is that if you believe the gospel, that Christ paid completely for sins at the cross, then any attempt at law for righteousness ends. It comes to an end, comes completely to an end. And this is what Paul is going to detail for us as he continues from verse 5 and and on in Romans 10, that there is a faith righteousness which says certain things over and against a law righteousness which attempts certain things. And a faith righteousness is done with trying to keep law to get righteousness. Christ ends that. Faith righteousness ends that. By the way, if, if there were no Christ, then law for righteousness would stand. That would be the way to get to heaven, and no one would get there. But Christ has come. And Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, secures forever 
God's free gift of righteousness to all who believe. And that principle goes beyond the relationship that Jews have to the gospel. That touches the relationship that everyone has to the gospel. Your only hope is Christ. An older commentator said this, with Christ in the field, law as means of attaining righteousness has ceased. The moment a man sees Christ and understands what he is and what he has done, he feels that legal religion is a thing of the past. The way to righteousness is not the observance of statues, no matter though they have been promulgated by God himself. It is faith, the abandonment of the soul to the redeeming judgment and mercy of God in his son. Listen, friends, if you're here this morning and you have never experienced forgiveness, you need to know that you have spent your life stacking your record of crimes against your maker and you will meet him one day, one day very soon, and you will have to give an account for your deeds, your thoughts, your motives, the secrets of the heart. God has seen it all. He knows it all. And you will be judged and eternally punished for those crimes. But you must know there is hope in Christ. Maybe you're here this morning and you've been aware of your sins to some degree, but you've thought that you could outrighteous your own sins. That you could outperform your own misdeeds, that you could make up that maybe on God's scale, your good deeds could outweigh your bad. And as we've seen this morning, and I, I hope that you've heard, your, your good deeds are actually over on that pile of the bad ones. Your best deeds are on that pile of the bad ones, and there is no balancing the scales. But there is a way to empty that ledger completely and totally to stop aiming to merit righteousness by your own resources, to abandon yourself and trust everything to Christ. Listen, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, is the savior of the world who came to a cross 2,000 years ago to put his life in our place, to die the death we deserved and to extinguish the wrath of God against every offense, past, present, and future that any believer would ever commit. Trust in him and you will never be disappointed. In fact, you'll get a lot more than you bargained for. Not only will you get a clean slate, you'll get a new life. You'll be a new creature with new power, new abilities, new desires, a new direction in life. Best of all, you get God himself. Would you come to him? If you'd like to know how to know God through Jesus Christ personally, would you talk to somebody before you leave today? Talk to one of the people you've seen up front or to me, any of the pastors of the church or the people next to you. I'd love to introduce you to eternal life through Christ. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths of forgiveness, of life, of hope that are a balm to the soul in the midst of trying circumstances, that are light in the midst of darkness, that really are our everything. Oh God, would you forgive us for having tried so hard to hang on to that anchor that takes us to the bottom of the ocean rather than trust in the Savior. And would you soften hearts and open eyes for those who have heard this gospel that they would no longer remain willfully ignorant but that they would relent, repent and subject themselves to the grace and love which is in your son. Lord, we would say with all our hearts, we who love you, who have been loved by you, all we have is Christ. Christ.